Welcome back to D&D Live 2020. I am Anna Prosser and this is my co-host Mika Burton. Mika, Hello. we just saw the new adventure be announced. I cannot wait. Ice, Maidens, Goliath <laughs> Sports. What more what do you be need? <laughs> what could be better? Well, now we've got lots more to talk about because we are here to talk about new D&D comic books and we're joined by some new guests. We've got Amy Garcia, AJ Mendez, Jim Zub, and Jody Hauser. Welcome to the show, guys. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hey. It is Let's so right to into see it. everyone's faces. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're really right, excited so to be here. Yes, here we have from right. IDW, uh, At the Spine of the World is going to be a new comic book coming out. It takes place in the Icewind Dale and Ten Towns. Speaking of Icewind Dale that we just yeah. uh, heard about, can you give us a little more detail on what we should be seeing? Um, well, it is connected to the Rhyme of the Frost Maiden world. Um, so we're excited to kind of reveal that. Um, Icewind Day in the middle of a non-stopping blizzard, uh, an endless night, and the them being driven to madness. So that's kind of where our story begins. Exactly. Mm. Lots of feral beasts. You know, we all we all need <laughs> them. And, uh, we're excited to introduce some really fun new characters that we actually based on history. AJ found this Ooh. really cool article about this Viking woman who was a warrior and had a hero's burial and didn't die, even though she had a blunt ax wound to the face. And so we were like, well, we have to create a character and make a barbarian and she had a hero's. And everyone thought that only Viking males battled but once we found out that that's not true we created runa which we're really excited to introduce to the world <gasps> runa is the name of our our protagonist she is it is uh in old old norse there's the etymology it might be mighty strength or secret love and we just thought that that really represented who she is um you know who survives an axe to the head and just keeps fighting like that <laughs> we want to know who she would what kind of person she would be um and it's just really representative of all of Icewind Dale these people are hardened and they're tough survivalists so you know what happens when that's the kind of world you have to live in do you mm -hmm. kind of crack under the pressure or are you this this forged weapon um yeah. so all of our characters are, are pretty rough around the edges um <laughs> but we also have um amos who's a human warlock um he is going to be this clever smart ass who's got his own secret um, he is so much fun we uh, we have potty mouths and he's kind of our way to you know channel that <laughs> <laughs> And then we also have Sarvin, our favorite, you know, dragonborn ranger. So we thought, you know, we'll bring him back for some funny and, you know, just adventure going because he's so carefree and down for whatever. So we're like, yeah, we have to have a dragonborn in there. So that was that was yeah, really fun. He actually comes to us from Frost Giant Fury, which Jim, our co-panelist, um, did. So we have a little wink in there for you, Jim. <laughs> the little <laughs> Frost Giant Fury wink for everybody. <laughs> Um, well, it's all part of the same world. Another... I'm so excited to see what you put together here. It's just, uh, it's awesome to see this stuff continuing on in the, in the comic series. And the Frozen North is filled with so much possibility. So, it really is. It's kind of terrifying. It's a little, um, you know, John Carpenter the thing, and it's, it's, it's <laughs> uh, Lovecraft, and and I, I think there's just there's there's so much that we can play with there, and. In keeping with those really tough, hard characters, we have Patience, who's a tiefling rogue. Um, she has zero patience. She's <laughs> snarky and witty. Yeah. <laughs> when she's like, snarky and will cut you if you mess with her. And I'm like, AJ, this is basically you. Like, you are... It's just based on me. Yeah. He's a total she's snarky. A, just a cranky grandma. That's uh, my soul. So. <laughs> yeah. And then our final character, Amy is a druid who we love. He's a spoiled, total uh, trust fund rich kid who has no <laughs> skills. So we thought it would be hysterical if you had a little um, little nugget who doesn't ever work and doesn't have any skills in the middle of blizzards and wild beasts coming to attack them. And Belvir is um, going to be our kind of naive, soft-hearted little brat. <laughs> now, 
Now, guys, um, I want to hear, we heard about so many great characters. I was especially touched by Runa, where her name might mean, like, mighty strength or secret love. I feel like that tells us that there's probably going to be a lot of depth to these characters. Which are your favorites, and can you give us any hints of what, you know, kind of human existential character arcs we might be looking forward to? Because that's what we all love about D&D, right, is the change in a person as they go through these adventures. I think that exactly. we're going to see the, the biggest change coming from, um, I believe, like, Amy and I both, our favorite really right now is Runa. She's just this woman who breaks all all the rules and all the expected rules of society. Um, but she she's never left Icewind Dale, and, and this is her home, and she has to defend it. Um, and then on the completely other side of the spectrum is Belvier, who has really entered the harsh realities of the world and like, how is he, how is he going to survive? So we have this really hardened warrior and this just soft boy. <laughs> how, how <are> we <laughs> the, other, the other great thing about D and D is the sense of family and community. And so what we love about Runa is she's a barbarian. So she, she, when she gives a blood debt, you know, she will, she will, she will die for you and she dies for her tribe. And she has this innate sense of, community and family. And what we'll see throughout these adventures is that her family widens and she she finds this new family with this ragtag team of characters who are nothing like her, who are a quarter of her size. And I think that really captures the spirit of D&D where you have all different people come together with like, you know, different interests. And, and Martin Kokolo, who we're seeing here is, I have to give a shout out to the artist. He is so cinematic in his drawings. You feel like you're in the middle of a battle and he has been crushing it. And we geek out every time we get emails. We're like, oh my God, he's so amazing. And we forget that, you know, it could just pop off the page with an incredible artist. So I think the sense of family is and community um, through these characters really hopefully will shine and um, and we think that that's really the spirit of of this world is making your friends and making your family a little bigger. I'm also seeing yeah, dogs on the page, dogs. which is very dogs. important. Oh, right. Yeah, we had to get the pups in there. Um, right. <laughs> I I I felt like you immediately know who somebody is with how they interact with um with the puppers, and we we immediately have that uh, two very distinct interactions with them and. Uh, they're, they're kind of a little Easter egg in there. We're excited about that. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I know that I can trust a storyteller when they say that dogs are important to the story. Right. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure that everyone listening out there is immediately like, when can I get a copy of this? Because there's dogs. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, we spent this time in the, the fantasy world of Icewind Dale and kind of looking into that world, but we also wanted to talk about this world that's a little bit closer to our own, where we go see Stranger Things and Dungeons and Dragons meet in a comic book with Jim and Jody. Stranger Things. What, yes. what is this? How is this going to take place, guys? <laughs> Jody, you're going to, uh, yeah, l let her rip. Explain how this all works, because it's an amazing, amazing project. <laughs> Okay, so I have been working on the Stranger Things comics for Dark Horse for a while, and Jim has obviously been working on the Dungeons & Dragons comics for IDW, and I don't actually know whose genius idea it was to be like, hey, let's put those two things together, because, you know, they have a lot in common. But, uh, yeah, so we're actually telling the story of... Uh, the friends and their sort of entire path as D and D players, like from when they first started playing when they were younger kids, you know, well before season one, all through the three seasons that we've seen and just how D and D has been sort of the core of their friendship and is their shared language and how the game changes as their lives have changed and their friend circle has expanded and just sort of touching down at different games at different points in their lives and relationships and seeing how everything keeps on moving. I think that's what makes it so unique is it's not just a story about the game being played. It's about why we play these games and the kinds mm. of bonds that they create between us. You know, <clears throat> in the Stranger Things series, Dungeons and Dragons takes on a lot of different symbolism. But at the heart of it, it's about that sort of group dynamic and what keeps them questing together, you know, and the kinds of courage that, that the game exemplifies in their lives. And so using that now as a storytelling tool, 
Jody and I talked about what kind of key moments, you know, the very first time that they play D&D or they get the game in their hands, the way it changes their their friend, you know, kind of dynamic and, and then key moments throughout the seasons what has happened, you know, based around D and D. So we get to see glimpses of what's happening in the game and the campaign that they play really kind of for the first time, like they touch upon it in the show, but it's always kind of, uh, you know, the end of a sequence or just a little brief kind of action moment. And now we're going to get to dig in a little bit more to what those characters mean. But a lot of it is about how those characters exemplify themselves and the kind of courage that it, it, you know, summons up inside them. And so it's a really nice character piece and that's what's really joyous about it. Um, I got to dig into my nostalgia for first edition D and D cause I started playing kind of around the same age as these characters in the early eighties. So first edition D and D research, I got to pull out all my old books, uh, <laughs> you know, get my, my first edition uh, player's handbook in there and, and, um, make sure that it's accurate to what was out at each year, you know, during the show. But then also, along with that nostalgia, really tell a character story and an emotional story. And that's what makes it work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about Stranger Things is that it is such a time capsule of its era. And we sort of want to continue that through and make sure all the D&D stuff is right on the money. Because there's definitely people who will notice if we do it wrong. I mean, Jim, first of all, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. I'm a little specific. The, the, normally, when you're working on any kind of <clears throat> commercial project, you've got you know a reference pool. Um, I'm scanning so much stuff. I've got screenshots of all kinds of different things. At one point, I was trying to find out what the suggested retail price of um, the original, you know, D&D box set, the basic set was. I was trying, you know, asking all these crazy questions just to make sure we get it right, because I just wanted to feel like it's in that time. You know, one of the things I really love about the cover, it's got the original, you know, D&D logo on there. Like, I know that obviously fifth edition is the standard and and I love it a lot but but there's something really special about original D&D and that logo conjures up so many good memories for me and hopefully for a lot of other people as well so yeah mhm and you were talking about how you know you got to go back into the old original dungeon master guide and are there yeah. any cool D&D easter eggs that you've written to this comic that longtime D&D fans can get excited about or are are those hush hush <laughs> Uh, there, there is quite a bit. So there's some really strange things that people may not have realized. On the original box set of D&D, for example, the basic set, um, the polyhedron dice were not specifically made for D&D. They were ordered from like a math company that would use them to... <laughs> Uh, explain concepts of randomized numbers. And so the D20, although it has 20 sides on it, actually has 1 to 10, 1 to 10. And the game would include a little, um, like a crayon or a marker that you would mark off half the sides so they were like the low 10 and the high 10. Because, again, the dice were not specifically manufactured for the game. And so uh, when I was talking to the gang, I was sending them these screenshots of this is how the old stuff looked. Can we have that on the dice? We don't have to call it out specifically in the story, but if someone sees that D20, that half the sides are marked up, will they recognize that and kind of realize, holy crap, you know, they, they really made it as, as, you know, substantial and, and uh, accurate as possible, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And those emails I just got a history really lesson. Fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and that's dorky stuff that the vast majority of people will not pick up on, but I love that kind of stuff. Like when I did the, the Rick and Morty versus D and D series, we went through, you know, five editions of D and D and every time we would use material from a specific era, we always tried to hit it properly. And that meant a lot to me that we would get it right. You know, so if Rick Sanchez is calling out some weird thing from first edition that he's saying it exactly, you know, right from the book or what may have you, and no one will probably notice the vast majority of people, but when they do, (laughs) you can see that there's, there's care involved and there's a real love and nostalgia for the material, you know, and Jody knows these characters so well from the writing she's been doing in the Stranger Things comic series. So it's been great to be able to bounce stuff off of her in terms of getting the emotional arcs right with the characters, making sure the voices sound right. She's been writing them for years now. So it's just nice to be able to kind of take both elements of it and, and put it all together. 
Yeah, and it's also, I'm, I think, especially fun to delve into something that, you know, obviously they're still surrounded by all the events in the series and all the darkness and monsters that they had to fight. But, you know, getting to see them in sort of their quieter moments and the moments that really build up who they are as people mm -hmm. to even be able to deal with all this, you know, crazy upside down and Demogorgons and all of that. So I always find stories like that that really examine the foundations of who characters are and what has shaped them to be who they are to be really exciting and I think uh, the way we crafted the mini series where it's just snapshots at different points you really you get to see that evolution really really clearly and they grow yeah and Diego Galindo the artist on the series he's got a really tough job because you want to have these characters look like the actors but you don't want it to look boring or traced like photographs you don't want it to be static they still have to have a lot of you know emotive qualities and that's really tough for an artist to do when you've got to do likenesses and still have them in new scenarios and i think he's done a just a phenomenal job at balancing those two elements out the characters are instantly recognizable but they don't feel stiff the the pages are just lush and full of really beautiful moments and emotion um, it's it's been a really special project to be a part of. It's yeah, a beautiful cover. Cover's so good. That cover yeah, is gorgeous, stunning. and I love how it just it feels like it's very much at the heart of both uh, you know the characters and the the characters that they're playing. So, and there's something very iconic and simple about it, but it, it harkens back to that era very well. You know. Mm hmm. You know, guys, I was thinking about what it must be like to write stories like these in comic books to have this visual and um, literary medium. And I know that as D&D &D players, one of our favorite things to do is share the stories of our adventures and tell what happened to our characters to other players <laughs> of D&D &D that love it that much. So you kind of got to do that. You got to tell the story that you imagined. Are there any particular pieces, and you don't have to, you know, spoil the story, but if somebody's going into these comic books and they're wanting to see, like, the coolest moment, what would be some of the places you would point them to, moments that you were like, oh, this was so amazing, I just want to tell this story to everybody? And why don't we start with Amy and AJ on, the, on yours? Well, for me, Ooh, I feel like you don't know what you're capable of until you're in it, right? And you don't know what choices you make. And so I think one of the best moments um, for me is like, what do you do when you have to choose between making a selfish choice and doing a choice that would benefit your tribe and community? Mm. And so I've had to deal with that, you know, like actor, it just, it's a, I, I always, stick with my people and, and we'll fight for them. And I'm, I'm ride or die with AJ. I'm ride or die with my inner circle. And I feel like we wanted, for me, it's this woman who is a barbarian and, um, you know, she's, she's in this very, um, dangerous, raw, almost like a, like an Iceland, like a today's Iceland where the elements are dangerous enough, much less like the beasts that are coming out you know, of nowhere, and she makes a choice. She actually chooses to, you know, protect her tribe and her team instead of going to what's comfortable and what she knows and going back to her barbarian tribe. So for me, it's all about expanding, um, you know, and stepping up for your people, but you don't know if you step up until, like, you're in the shit, and you're like, oh, and then <laughs> once you step up in the shit, then you're like, oh, I'm the kind of character or the kind of person that steps up when the chips are down for, for the people I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And playing, playing with that, you know, there is that side where we have the, like the very clear black and white, what is the, the, the right choice. But sometimes, especially in a world that is so rough, like Icewind Dale, that choice might not be clear. You might need to make some question, morally questionable choices. And I think that that is a really a part of D&D that is so that is so interesting is that what is right? Like, can can you be mm. a little bit bad and a little bit good at the same time? Are you making the right choices, um, the the wrong choices for the right reasons? Um, mm. So that's something that we're, we're really playing with uh, in this, and we're excited to, to share that. Oh, look at the cover! I don't think there's the cover. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, because oh, when you're crazy characters from scratch you have to not only build their appearance and their background but also their moral compass and i remember aj and i having this conversation about a particular character who we won't mention one of the ones you saw might be morally ambiguous and i really struggled with that and i thought well 
if there's right and there's wrong, and he's like, no, in a crazy world, you know, you look at like Walking Dead shows where it's apocalyptic and dire, you might have to do something bad for the right reasons. And I really had to sit on that. And AJ had to convince me that what's beautiful about D&D is <laughs> that it's not black and white. It's very gray, and there are shades of gray. And these characters should reflect those shades of gray. You might have to burn down a family hut in order to save the village, or you might have to, you know. <laughs> oh my goodness! We don't do that. We don't. We, not yet. Not yet. We've all been there. No. No one's in the so hut. Funny, before we started the stream, I was talking to them, and they they were talking about writing on the D and D comics, and I said when I started doing the D and D comics back in 2014, um, what I wanted to try and give to the series was a sense that. So anything can happen at the table that those split second decisions, the dungeon master doesn't know what's coming and the players don't quite know where the story is going to go and that it has a bit of a runaway train kind of feel. And if you're doing the action right, I feel like that's quintessential D and D to me is that it's got that feeling of <clears throat> big choices, big moments, you know, and that's what I'm really excited to see in, uh, you know, spine of the world, see what, uh, See what the girls put together here. I'm super excited to read it. And the artwork is phenomenal. I'm really, really impressed. This is the first time I'm seeing those pages too. And I'm just like pumped. I'm pumped to see this adventure come together. And, uh, and these characters. We're very inspired by your, your book, you know? We were like, Jim, we're fans. We, you gave us such a great <laughs> jumping off point. We feel like we have to carry the torch of adventures with, with new rugrats, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> The, the world of D&D are so expansive and they're just infinite. You can do, you know, different parts of the world, different groups of adventurers, and it feels like it can encompass anything. You can do a horror story. You can do a mystery. You can do big action, soft, you know, dramatic moments. Um, that's what role playing is all about, is about options, giving options to the players and giving options to the readers. Absolutely. So. It's Jody awesome. and Jim, did you guys have any particular uh, moments or, or themes you wanted to point out for readers to look for in your books that were your favorite parts of the story? I you mean, I first, think Jody. one of my favorite, yeah, one of my favorite things is actually, obviously, there's the adventure that the boys are playing, but sort of seeing some of the behind the scenes stuff, like, what does the DM do when, you know, a character's maybe supposed to be dead and he doesn't really want them to be <laughs> dead? Like, how do you cope with that? So I think, like, mm -hmm. that was a really fun because that's sort of not something you really get to see very often in, in these stories is sort of like the behind the scenes and the angst and like the DM having to act like they know what they're doing when they maybe really don't. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and just what happens when the party expands too. How do, how do new players coming into a game fit in and how does that change the dynamic? Um, uh, we had a lot of fun discussing Max because remember they talk about what the different character classes are and she says she wants to be a Zoomer and it's like, and wait like, a minute, what's a a thing. there's no such thing as a Zoomer. And so then we were, I was going through the books and I was like, no, there's no such thing as a Zoomer, but, and then you start digging into what's actually possible <clears throat> in D&D and I found a canon way to make a Zoomer work, but not the way I think people will expect. And uh, and it's it surprisingly works in the context of even first edition D and D, and I'm pretty happy with that. So that's kind of a little cute thing, where it was a bit of a challenge that the show gave us. Like, okay, how would you make that work? Putting Max and Eleven at the table was a real joy, and I think is it it allows them to blossom and see a different side of themselves, and it plays off of the changing dynamic that happens in the group. Uh, you know, in the show over the course of those seasons. So there's some really, really fun and cute moments. And um, probably the, the scene I'm most proud of is in the first issue, we show how Dustin um, meets the other boys. Uh, thanks oh, to yeah, the power. And I was really nervous about writing that because that's literally a moment that we've never seen in the show. And I'm writing the first thing these kids say to each other and how they meet and uh i wrote it and i kind of you know jody went over it and we back and forth and found a really fun uh cute moment like a really great moment that feels like something right out of the show and is also exemplified thanks to dungeons and dragons so <laughs> and it's yeah it's very much who they are and it's sort of a great example of yes the these kids might not have all grown up together but they were always meant to be friends they were always meant to be a party Aww. Yeah, yeah, it's really sweet stuff. So, I feel like that's such a common theme that we're hearing in both of these stories, whether it's new content or it's based off of an IP that 
so many people know and love the sense of found family. And it seems that you guys are also putting your own experiences and what D and D means to you in these stories is, do you find that that's just an essential part of your writing? All four of you putting a piece of you into the story. Oh, for sure. I think, and I think, yeah, I was just going to say, I think like <laughs> me and Jim coming together to work on this for the first time, it is very much like a party coming together and like learning mm. how to work together. So there's even a little bit of that feeling just in the creative process of making the book. And we've started tabletop gaming now, Jody and I as well, which has been a lot yeah. of fun too, right? Just as a, I think it's an extension of that. You go to conventions and you meet people, other professionals and, and people in this field, and they become a bit like a found family. And that's what a role-playing game group is. You know, I met my wife through role-playing games. Um, I have some of my closest friendships, some of my deepest contacts in in the world are people that I've gamed with. And those experiences at the table they echo outwards in all kinds of directions. You know, I'm thrilled to be just a tiny little part of D&D Live this year. Last year, it was one of the best events of my life. I got to play with Micah and Anna. I got to play with all kinds of other amazing people. And and that shared bond of D&D and, and gaming together, it changes you in all the right ways. It makes you empathize more and build uh, build better bonds with people. So I can't help but put that into, into my storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, telling I stories together is, yeah, the best way to start a friendship, in my opinion. So. Well, even with Jim and Jody, when we were waiting to be on live, we just started asking them about, you know, Jim's like, I've been playing D&D &D since I was eight years old. My older <laughs> brother brought me into it. And then AJ was curious. AJ's like, well, how do you guys write together as a team? And then we started picking their brain and it just kind of became this really nice kind of new dynamic. And I think when they said, when we were talking about Stranger Things, I said, you know, I think Stranger Things really captures the D&D &D spirit of never growing up and still always playing. Like just because you're above the age of 12, it doesn't mean you can't manifest your fantasy into something real with other people. And I never want to grow up. I mean, I, I refuse to like, really become a grown-up but I I, I, I I pay bills and parking tickets and stuff but I think <laughs> I love about stranger things and is that it reminds you to never lose that childlike spirit of wonder and imagination and being open and realizing that we're all we're all like on the same journey you know so so I think um it seems like you guys infused into that. Now we have like new friends. You know, I, I was looking up, I was right. like, yeah, Mika's so hot and Anna's so hot. How is this? I was like talking to my friends. I'm, like, so I'm just so excited. You know, so I just feel like the community just keeps getting bigger and bigger because there's this, there's this universal sense of play and, yeah. um, and adventure, you know? Mm -hmm. that, that's been one of the most exciting things for me being, able to contribute to D&D, &D, you know, since 5th edition launch, uh, being able to do the comics, the Rick and Morty series, the the Young Adventurer's Guides to try and bring new people into the hobby. All that stuff is about sharing time together and spending time and, and, and making experiences that we're all going to remember. And they're interactive and they're engaging. And the emotional stuff is real. The bonds are real. The friendships are real. <clears throat> and that's what makes these games so special and why I think they're better than almost any other kind of entertainment you can find, you know? Absolutely. And if we can get people into that, thanks to the comics or remind them about that stuff, then that's, then that's what, you know, what we want to do. A hundred percent. And uh, reminders to everybody who's been watching this at the spine of the world. Issue one comes out October 21st at idwpublishing.com. Stranger Things and Dungeons and Dragons comes out November 4th, 2020, darkhouse.com. And you can get 20% off at the spine of the world and all D&D products if you use the code D&D Live 2020. It is value through, uh, valid through June 18th through the 30th at idwpublishing.com. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. This has been awesome. Thank we just love you. Thank pleasure. you for having me. I feel a lot of good feels here. Yeah. Like, thank I you. My heart is so full. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nice to have Thank, thank you, you guys yeah, again so welcome. much. And uh, you so you, if you're watching, don't go anywhere because we are going to be right back. We're going to have a Heroes Feast coming right up. We'll see you very soon. Yes. <laughs>
people are doing incredible selfless things working from the front line. Like Pam, a nurse in a mobile clinic for a program supported by the Children's Health Fund, funded by Red Nose Day. Pam sees over 150 children a month and her advice and treatment can be life-saving. Staying open during the pandemic was essential because I knew our families were gonna be lost without anything. Thanks to your generosity, Pam and these mobile clinics are still going strong across the U.S. in the middle of this crisis. Thank you for giving to Red Nose and to Mobile Health Care. You're providing hope, health to so many children and families so that maybe one day they could be the ones serving and taking care of you. So thank you. Essential workers like Pam are the quiet heroes working from the front lines. I understand that times are tough right now. But if you can look in your heart and give whatever you can afford, we'd appreciate it. Hello and welcome back to D&D &D Live 2020. We are here for a hero's feast. That's right, it's oh. cookbook. And we are going to be cooking, Mika. This is actually a cooking show, like D&D &D meets cooking. This is my two only interests in the world. I am so ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> we have some special guests here with us. We have John Peterson, Kyle Newman, and Michael Whitworth. Welcome, guys. We're so excited to see what you're going to cook. Could you guys uh, introduce yourselves each in a row and then let us know what you're going to be cooking for us today? Fantastic. Absolutely. So, uh, John? I'm John Peterson, and uh, I study the history of role-playing games and war games, and I am going to be making drinks. Too many people on the internet. It's time to off it's all blurred on there. So um, that's my plan. Great. Hmm. What about you, Kyle? And uh, Kyle? Oh, Michael, you go. All right, sure, <laughs> sure. Right, I'm, uh, Kyle, I'm, I'm Michael Kyle Newman, and, and today we are making... Oh, you're going, Michael. I'm going. Uh, I'm Michael Whitwer. Uh, I'm an author. I write about D and D. I work with these two other these are the two other people we're on today uh, to do a lot of books on D and D. And today I'm going to cook elven bread, or I'm going to bake elven bread to be exact. And, and I'm Kyle, Kyle, what about Whitwer, you? And we are cooking. We're cooking pan fried knucklehead trout, and we've got an array of ingredients ready to go. This is an this Ice Dale good. specialty. Now, uh, let's get right into the first one, because we, we only have so much time. I don't know how you guys are going to cook <laughs> us an entire meal of fish and bread and a cocktail. So we should get started right away. I think we're going to start with elven bread, right? Yes, take it away, Absolutely. Michael. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we're going to use a little bit of magic here. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, for everybody watching, Elven bakers have been protecting this recipe for generations. What you're about to see <laughs> has never been seen before. So, okay, so I'm just going to put it out there. And as you can see, there it is a visual of uh, some of the original illustrations we have for this book. Beautiful. So uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I, again, elves um, are known for, we did a lot of study on this during the, during the preparation of this book, the kinds of ingredients they're into. Think wholesome, light. Um, delicious flavors, um, all natural ingredients. They don't like preservatives. They prefer citrus to, to salt. That's the kind mm. of uh, palate that, that we've found with a lot of elves. In this particular case, this elven bread here uh, is actually one that was originally, I will tell you from part of our research, was sourced from the Aurora's Guide, which is, a, is an obscure uh, second edition catalog, kind of an in-world catalog of Forgotten Realm stuff that you could buy. An elven bread was in there. It originates from the Isle of Evermeet, if, if you know Evermeet, that's where um, a lot of elven people are from. And uh, so we're going to give this a shot. Now, I have already pre-prepped uh, most elements of this bread. We're not going to sit here and watch me bake, as it were. <laughs> um, but uh, so I've basically done all the, 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 the previous steps. So what I have here is dough here in front of me. I hope you can see it. It's kind of laid out right in front of me, right where my name tag is. So the things I'm doing are brilliant, <laughs> I promise. Um, and in this dough here, we've got uh, yeast, uh, whole milk, honey, eggs, butter, salt, whole wheat flour, as well as all-purpose flour. So again, really wholesome. This is just an absolutely delicious, not only a snack bread, it can be a dessert bread, it can be a breakfast bread, all kinds of things. Well, all we're going to do here today is kind of the finishing steps before I go ahead and put it um, in the oven. 
uh, which is I'm going to do a, a little bit of an egg wash right here on the bread. Now, I don't know how well you can see this. And by the way, if it looks like I don't know what I'm doing at any time, that's not the case at all. I'm using secret Elven techniques. Right. And that's, right, that's what yeah. it is. So, so please mm -hmm. be aware of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I see them. I see what, the what techniques. We, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. right? You've never seen this before. Mm -hmm. So like uh, what we're doing elf. here again. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we're doing this light egg wash inside. And the reason we do that is not only to let the filling adhere uh, to the inside of the bread. It's a swirl bread. It's also to actually prevent gaps from filling when you, break the, when you uh, bake the bread. So it has that kind of dual purpose. Okay, now we've got a nice egg wash all the way inside. And what we have here, if you can see it, uh, this is a cinnamon and sugar um, filling, basically a powder. Ooh. So we're just going to apply that lightly. Yeah, this is going to be pretty good, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to do it really fast, as if I'm like Rick Bayless or something like that. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So we've got now our filling applied throughout. And this is the last piece here. And I, again, I hope you can see at least some of this. What I'm now going to do is I'm just going to spread out the filling just kind of once nicely over. And I'm going to roll this up. Uh, this is basically a rolled log. And that's how the swirl Yum. effect is created in the bread. So oh. again, I'll hold it up before um, I get a little flour in my hands. See, and it's, it's my awful doing watering. this in the middle of the afternoon because I'm hungry yeah. right now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? And so we're going to go ahead and place the log seam side down, and I'll try to show that to you about oh, what that yeah. looks like. As you can see, the, you've got the buttered pan here, and you've got the seam side there. So that's going to actually rise for a little while, and then we're going to use a little bit of magic today and make this bake <laughs> extra fast and just see if, um, if we can't get a pretty good result. That's awesome. Wonderful. Well, while that magic is happening, I think it's trout time. Oh, it's trout time over here in New Jersey. <laughs> so we've got um, pan-fried knucklehead trout. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this dish, but I think if you're, you or your characters ever visited 10 towns up above the spine of the world, you would know that this is a very popular dish. And we're going to make it today. So what would you like to know? Well, first of all, what is a knucklehead trout? <laughs> well, knucklehead trout, there's three lakes and those lakes service the 10 towns and this knucklehead trout can only be found in this region. And it's known because it has this bulbous knucklehead and people make things out of the heads and it's a popular thing that they export, but the meat itself is very great and flavorful. And if you're in other realms, you can also use different types of trout. So today I'm using rainbow trout instead because mm. COVID had prevented the shipment of knucklehead trout to me. So right. we're going to go with something else in the trout family. <laughs> and um, I, what you see what I've done here is I've taken this and I've, I've pre uh, peppered and salted it. And you want to let that soak in, uh, and sit and breathe for about five minutes before you take it to the pan. And we're going to walk over here to the pan and we are going to cook this um, right up and I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil in here. You're supposed to mm. measure, but it's Thursday. Magical and measurement. We get it to it. Yeah. You want to, you want to do this at like a medium high type temperature. And if you don't have your unseen servant, you want to make sure you're being very careful when you touch hot things and when you're cutting <laughs> <laughs> me, I use a mage hand and I, and I, pre prep most of this we could jump through phases but what we're going to do is we're going to take this this delicious piece of trout and we're going to put it down flush side first and you put it very gently into the pan what you want to do is massage it a little love your food and then you're going to mm. you're going to let this cook for about two to three minutes on each side and what we want is it to be a uh you want an opacity in the flesh and you want to make sure it gets like a golden brown. And then we're going to flip it. And we're going to do this. You know, when it's ready, you're going to make sure it gets a nice golden brown. And then we'll take it and we're going to flip it. And um, the first one I forgot to do with this one, which I made a mistake, is very sorry. We're going to go back up here. I forgot to bread. Oh, yum. And you gently bread Important. it. And what I've oh, done here is yes. this is a, this is flour, salt, and paprika. 
and you want to use a sweet paprika and you, you, you gently rub it on and bread it. And we know that I, the I last the dish most was important first phase. The last dish was Elvin. What kind of cuisine are we looking at here with that sweet paprika? Now this is a human dish and human. Oh. We take this right from the, the player's handbook and it's a broad spectrum. And that really relates to humans across the whole multiverse. They are the most adaptable, uh, diverse. Uh, you're going to see them living in all types of topographies and environments. And that's reflected in their cuisine too. And humans, uh, their food tend to be um, quicker to prep, quicker to eat, because they want to get on with adventuring and conquering and, and, and doing things, as opposed to, you know, elves and dwarves might let their, their foods marinate longer, and they might savor it a little bit differently. But humans want to get on with their business. And just a place like uh, Toril has tons, dozens of, of cultures and subcultures and, um, you know, regions that all speak to different types of food. Uh, so up north here, you've got fresh fish. You're going to get gamey, gamey meat. Um, there's a lot of barbarian tribes and hunting, uh, but also humans are known for foraging and farming, and it's going to kind of cover the whole spectrum. And uh, 10,000 in particular, were, uh, you know, this is the delicacy. When you guys were researching this Go this cookbook, it. you were you were looking all over the realms for these recipes. I imagine that finding a human recipe may have been a little easier, uh, but I don't know. You guys <laughs> have done research through through years and years of of D and D and Forgotten Realms lore, correct? This is forty five uh, exactly years of research, right. I just mean, like we did with Art and Arcana. Yep. Yeah, just yeah, like we did with Art and Arcana. We... This is a deep dive into the fiction and the and also what's been in the game. And so there's a lot of cross-referencing between what might have been cited in a book 30 years ago and then what's, in, what's mentioned in the game book later about what, what uh, ingredients are readily available. So um, it became fun finding out, uh, comparing things years apart, decades apart by different authors and finding out what makes up the cuisine and the palate of these cultures. Mm. Yeah, and, and if I may add, um, so we've got you know, this. What, that oh, was a really fun part of the, the process, this notion that, you know, as researchers, the research isn't really any different. It's just that it happened to be on fictional elements, right? So we're scouring mm -hmm. through 45 years of D&D rule books and novels and all kinds of things uh, to find where they've mentioned food. And, and what's interesting is that it, it wasn't a particularly rich history relative to a lot of other things that exist in D&D. Um, hmm. So, again, there are some notable things that stand out. You know, if anyone that reads Dragonlance, for example, would know Otic's spicy fried potatoes, right? They talk about them all the time. So things like that are low-hanging <laughs> fruit. But, um, but there was a lot of things that really weren't very fleshed out. So it really became this, really, this, this interesting study about jumping into where we, would, where we could really do a, a study of these different fantasy cultures and figure out, well, wh what are the availability of ingredients that halflings have? What is the etiquette of, of, of elven people? What do they think about? How does morality co connect with their, mm -hmm. own, their own appetite? A, a good example of that, elves we discovered uh, almost across the board, they, they have um, a lot of food restrictions, usually based on their beliefs. Uh, elves, of course, being people that really value life and uh, all types of life. And so again, we found that there's a lot of vegetarians and pescatarians and vegans within, within elven cultures. And so we tried to reflect all of that in the book as we really dug deep on what these different uh, fantasy cultures really like when it comes to food. That's incredible. I yeah. mean, that sounds like a dream job <laughs> is to research what <laughs> elves eat. <laughs> yeah. It it was, it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. They actually, they actually, they actually paid us for this too. I can't believe it still, but <laughs> how is that fish looking Kyle? So we've got a couple things going on here. We've got the fish and it's ready and, and we're making a sauce. Now this sauce consists of, um, four, four tables of freshly in shallots pre-cut in here. And we're going to let this get gold. Golden brown. We want it to be an aromatic, almost nutty type scent. And it's about, like I said, two to three minutes. You don't want to burn it, but you want to, you know, gently stir it around and make sure it's getting evenly cooked. It's going to look something like, something like this. And then what we're going to do is this mixture and we are going to adorn it on top of our right on top of our uh, trout right here. Oh, mm. it's really not helping my hunger. <laughs> mm. And you want to take you want to take a lemon and what you want to do is normally you take the lemon and you take half of it 
and you'd want to just get all the juice out of there. And you can garnish it with, with cubes of the other half, a little, little uh, slices, and some additional parsley. You want about, uh, you know, a good two tablespoons of freshly chopped parsley because you're going to cook. The recipe calls for about four, four ounce pieces of, of trout. So that's what we're looking at right here. Wow. That is gorgeously beautiful. plated. Oh, I love a seashell plate as well. Yes. Nice little touch there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Seashell plate. I'll, I'll mail you guys this. You guys can try it in three days. <laughs> Kyle, what is your, uh, what's your favorite part of this recipe? What made it super interesting to you as part of the, the human cuisine and all of the research? Well, what I love about um, just researching D&D food and what D&D &D in general is it's so familiar, but there's something adjacent that um, mm. is fresh and exciting. And just learning about the, the nature, the ecosystem of, of uh, the Three Lakes and, and Ten Towns and you know how their cuisine evolves from that and what are the regional difficulties, the environmental difficulties, how people adapt. And, and you know this being like a signature dish, I just thought it was like getting something fresh, but mixing it with you know a couple exciting different things you wouldn't expect. And making something that you know you can bring to your tabletop because there's two things that are common and that's uh, between D and D and cooking is that you are gathered around a table and it is community and you're forming a little family and families eat together. So I just wanted to find things. And that was our mission with this book is find things that could bring people together uh, at a tabletop. And maybe it's something that's a little off the beaten path that you wouldn't normally get, but it brings you deeper into the, the in universe quality of the game that we all seek the immersion. That's Amazing. And so since we've had bread and we've had a main course, now it's time for personally my favorite part, the cocktail. Mm -hmm. John, how about you, you uh, have... take us into that? Yeah, so you've got to have something to wash all this down, all of this deliciousness. Oh, yeah. And one of the great constants of D&D &D, uh, throughout the ages is taverns and the fact that people get mm -hmm. together, they drink. This could be the place that you run into that wanderer with a treasure map who encourages you to go on the next <laughs> adventure or whatever. And if you're me, uh, beverages do play a certain role in playing the game as well. You will always find mm -hmm. beverages at my tabletop, uh, potent beverages. So we're going to talk <laughs> about one today that that we call the Mind Flayer. And uh, <laughs> I'm oh, no. sure most people watching this are familiar <laughs> with the idea of a Mind Flayer. This is something that can suck the intellect out of your brain. And so we, um, and these are drinks, by the way, that when we describe them, we never give them one name typically because we imagine there are a lot of regional variants of these that are going around. So some people might call this the cone of cold, making it a bit differently than we make it here. But the mind flare version is largely a, a grape juice and ginger and vodka drink that mm. will come out very cold. And so you will get an ice cream headache from your first hit of this, I promise. But to go a bit <laughs> into how you prepare it. Um, so it, it takes about three uh, tablespoons of cut up ginger. We've already cut up the ginger. Um, and then you need a good amount of lime juice as well. You can see we've got the, the fresh squeezed limes that were used for this. And what you end up with from that, uh, you put in the blender and it results in this kind of paste that you then kind of squeeze out with a little mini colander strainer here. And that ends up yielding the syrup. And the syrup is mm. the first ingredient we're then going to put into the big blender you see of this enormous ninja blender. And by the way, when I turn this on, I almost always flinch because it is a oh, no. blender. It takes about a minute to do the cycle. So don't be surprised if you see me flinch a bit. Before I put that in, we're going to start with the ice in this. And you need about three cups of crushed ice. And so I have some kind of pre-crushed ice here. And we're going to get in first. I hope it isn't too loud. <laughs> we will mute when we turn the blender on because I'm, I'm serious. This thing is a monster. The sun, the <laughs> yes, everything. no worries. Need, uh, <laughs> protect the headphone users. Yeah. Exactly. We need three cups of that. And then we're going to put in this beautiful grape juice concentrate. And this mm. is what really is going to give you the hard grape flavor of this. We'll get that all in. We add to that then the syrup is very tasty. And then finally, we get to the good stuff. Now, you know, I've found and I've made this one a few times, you know, the, the we recommend five shots to go in this. And oh, this goodness. is not intended to serve one person. This is obviously for you and your entire adventuring party. But um, I'll put in probably four and a half here. I think that has worked for me doing this in the past. And once this is all in, we will seal up this arcane chamber and the alchemical reaction will begin. And like mm. I said, it will get quite loud here in a second. 
So let me get this all set up. And I will go on mute. You may talk among yourselves while I'm doing that. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I know that in a very important part of cookbooks is the food photography. You can't really get across how tasty this food is without looking at it. Can you guys talk about the process of the food photography for your cookbook, Heroes Feast? Absolutely. There was, um, and Kyle, feel free to, to jump in on, on this one. Um, so we did, um, I believe there are 40 or 50 photographs of the 80 dishes that appear in Heroes Feast. And, um, you know, I, I have to give it to our publisher, 10 Speed, who really spared no expense to make this, um, honestly, the absolute best food photography. I'm not exactly impartial here, but the best food <laughs> photography I, I, I've, I've ever seen. Um, you know, and, and part of that, again, was this, this notion that we felt very, very passionate about bringing D&D to life. You know, that's been done very, very seldom. If you consider there was once a D&D movie, there's, you know, maybe a couple examples. But how often have you ever seen uh, what was once an illustration come to life? We felt very mm. passionate to make sure that our food was appearing in scenes that were authentic. And one of the ways we did that was we actually commissioned to have a number of famous D&D magical items built. For example, you may, in, in some of the, the sides of the shot, see a dragon orb. Or you might see the hand oh. of Vecna in a shot over here. So I, again, we really, um, we we personally showed up to the photo shoot. They had a, an unbelievable team of art designers and photographers and prop people and production designers. It was uh, it, it was really beyond all expectation we could have had. And I think the results will will show at the end of the day. Looks like John may be ready to show us, but John, oh, we it can't is ready. quite it hear. Is ready. There you go. Okay, oh. now we can hear you. So tell us about the, the mic okay, player. Sorry. Well, so, I mean, it is done. I was just going to add to that bit about the photo shoot. We got to bring all kinds of cool props uh, that we Ooh. shot with it, many of which came from our, our private stashes here. And so uh, you'll see all sorts of great in-world artifacts that went along with those shots as well. Great. Now, I think uh, everybody has finished their dishes so should we go in order? We see the, the finished elven bread, starting with you, Michael. Uh, Michael, I think, I think your audio is muted. My apologies. Uh, I've been told <laughs> my mic is off. Um, so here we have our, our beautiful completed loaf of elven bread. And we're gonna go ahead and actually give that a cut here. So just give me a sec. Oh, my God. oh I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. All right, that. You gotta use what uh, you got when you're an adventurer, you know? It's true, it's true. And I'm gonna show you the swirl of this bread here, if we can. So Ooh. that's just this beautiful, wholesome, honey, butter, yeast, um, eggs, whole wheat. Um, again, I just, I actually love this. So my, my, my kids can't get enough of it. So uh, that's our elven bread. And again, a single bite of this might maintain an adventurer for an entire day on the trail. So it's a magical bread. Mm, I can't wait to try that one. And Kyle, Same. I think we, we, we saw the trout, right? You want to show us again one last time? Get well, the I've been full making meal more. I've been making more. Ooh. Yeah, so we had, uh, what I've got here is, you know, here's another bread. And there's some of this sauce. Again, it's shallots and butter and some salt and some pepper. And you want to get it golden brown and just drizzle it on top here. It's got a, a lemon crushed into it as well. You want to get some of those onions, shallots, and you want the... You always want to garnish. We're going to put some of the, the, the fresh parsley on top. And we're ready to go. It's got a very good taste between the creeka and the shallot and the butter, the olive oil, um, and the natural flavors of the trout. So it's a good indigenous dish if you're trying to start a campaign up in Icewind Dale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and John, how would you recommend that we, we serve this Mind Flayer cocktail? Well, so I prefer to do it, obviously, in an in appropriate goblet, the sort of thing you might find in the Yawning Portal, that you might find maybe even the Celestial Vista in Eberron. Of course. But it pours thick. This is almost mm. as fleshy as you can see. And I found that it works well, actually, with straw. Uh, <laughs> that in. And sometimes even stir it a little bit with the straw. 
But since we're getting towards the end of the segment, I will not resist partaking a little bit. <laughs> I, I imagine if you're an illithid, ah. you know, the tentacles get in the way, so a straw would help with the drinking. That's true. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Yeah. I'm not sure. Or if you're a dwarf with a large beard. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right, right, right. <laughs> important consideration. Man, I'm so jealous of I everyone. Confirm. They're just chowing down. <laughs> I, I can confirm the mind flayer does in, in, indeed flay your mind, so so beware. <laughs> but it is an unbelievably refreshing drink. Um, I, I, I can't say enough about the mind flayer. Well, look at this well, beautiful we are looking... cover. Yeah, go ahead, Mika. Oh, yeah, no, just it, it's clearly what everybody pictures when they're in a scene in a tavern and your DM is telling you that you're chatting up some local informant or you're just having some ale with your adventuring party it is it is warm it is hearty the food looks beautiful and right there in the corner release date october 27th 2020 so everyone at home can make their own mind flares knucklehead trout elven bread and more i'm assuming i'm hoping there's some stews i'm a a big fan of stew personally mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we've got well, there's, there's, there's stew stuff one of the first toast. recipes yep so many. There's stews. Yeah. There's bouillabaisse. There's, um, I mean, all kinds of different. Um, oh, it's it's it's. Um, we really, really tried to capture everything we possibly could. Uh, Sword Coast bouillabaisse, to be exact. So it's of course this great <laughs> seafood stew. Um, no, but but again, we really tried to be authentic too. You know, one thing that that it, you know to be, in a, as far as one can be, super serious about a a, a D and D cookbook. Um, we, we did. We took it, you know, really, really seriously with regard to being authentic and making sure that things we were making, they weren't, you know, they weren't just kind of tongue in cheek or, or silly, but they were things that were authentic to the D&D world, things you would actually get if you showed up at the Yawning Portal. Um, and, and that was just, again, it was a real passion of ours. And that's one of the reasons we actually, as part of our illustrations, which none of which are done, by the way, including that cover, I, I will tell you, <laughs> um, we're all at the conceptual stage right now, but we're, we're getting there. And uh, we actually did in-world menus for four of the most famous oh. uh, tavern establishments. So so at, at various points, you'll, you'll come across, for example, the Yawning Portal menu, and you'll come across the Celestial Vista, Vista menu, um, of course, In of the Last Home from Dragonlance. So we, we provided those to, again, provide even that much more authenticity. Thank you guys yeah, so much for all of that research is, that you did yeah. to, to get us into this, this world. And we can't wait to make these at our own table. Thank you so much for your time to come talk to us today and for making this food. That was an amazing marathon of cooking. It was. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, guys, remember, of course, that this is going to be available October 27th, 2020, if you're looking to add this cookbook to your own collection. And don't go anywhere because we're going to be right back with WizKids talking about some new miniatures. Don't forget in the meantime, during this break, that you can go to dndlive2020.com and donate to Red Nose Day so that D&D can match that donation up to $125,000 for a great cause. Yes. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a minute.
people are doing incredible selfless things, working from the front line. Like Pam, a nurse on a mobile clinic for a program supported by the Children's Health Fund, funded by Red Nose Day. Pam sees over 150 children a month and her advice and treatment can be life-saving. Staying open during the pandemic was essential because I knew our families were gonna be lost without anything. Thanks to your generosity, Pam and these mobile clinics are still going strong across the U.S. in the middle of this crisis. Thank you for giving to Red Nose and to Mobile Health Care. You're providing hope, health, to so many children and families so that maybe one day they could be the ones serving and taking care of you. So thank you. Essential workers like Pam are the quiet heroes working from the front lines. I understand that times are tough right now, but if you can look in your heart and give whatever you can afford, we'd appreciate it. Coronavirus has had an impact on us all in some way. And while children have not been the face of this pandemic, it's the kids already struggling in poverty who could suffer the most. Kids who are missing out on meals because their families can't put food on the table. Kids who can't easily access health care or medicines. And further away, children who don't have clean water or those who are already on the brink of serious hunger. But with your support, we can help. The money you give to Red Nose Day tonight means health care, clean water, medicine, and food gets to kids in the United States and around the world. $5 can help pay for vital medical supplies for children visiting a mobile health clinic. $35 can buy 50 masks to protect health workers across the globe while they do their life-saving job. $50 can help provide at least 500 meals for kids and families right here in America. You can make a difference right now. Go to rednoseday.org. Thank you. Welcome back to D&D Live 2020 Roll with Advantage, where we are raising money for Red Nose Day. As you saw, don't forget to visit dndlive2020.com if you'd like to donate. But right now, we are here to talk about some amazing new miniatures from WizKids, and we have yes. two new guests to welcome. Welcome V Muse 
and Patrick O'Hagan. You may know V Muse as the Crafty Muse on YouTube, the DM on Cobalt Press's Twitch, and for D&D in a Castle. And Patrick is the executive producer of RPGs at WizKids. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Hi. And we have a, a third guest as well. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, oh, no. we do. He snuck in. Did they freeze? <laughs> They might have I think up. they did freeze. <laughs> well, then we Either will be that talking. Or they're just very stoic. <laughs> they can be. They can absolutely be extremely stoic and very stiff yeah. in their lip if need be. Uh, <laughs> our guest is uh, Justin Zoran. <laughs> well, when they pop in, we will uh, speak with them. But they are stoic, just like the new line of minis. I'm so excited that I get to announce this line: <laughs> Icons Aww. of the Realms, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. I see a theme happening through this. Oh. <laughs> through the stream definitely absolutely and they are gorgeous for sure i'm looking at my table right now and it's like i want to show you every little thing but limited time <laughs> i mean you can show us as, as much as we have time for i know that we're super excited to see these new minis any dungeon dragons lover knows that if you have a dragon you have to see that dragon for it to really feel real can you tell us a little bit about this oh. new line of minis we'll be seeing I absolutely can. Do you want to start off with a different dragon, though, and uh, kind of tap into the whole celebrating D&D, maybe? Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, everyone knows about the Sapphire Dragon, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's coming in miniature form now. And I have with me this beauty. So this is, first of all, this is wow. the box that it comes in. Oh, <gasps> my goodness. I know, right? <laughs> it is it's stunning. So wow. this is its packaging. I'm trying to get it so it's like yoink, this way. There we go. Oh, wow. And then that's it's got this gorgeous artwork on the side. Oh, I also love that this is considered a yeah. mini. <laughs> it's you know, a mini air quotes. This is the right. back of it with its lore and everything. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. So that's, that, I mean, it's, it's a big box. <laughs> Yeah, so it's you know, gorgeous. This is a big dragon. I could probably like fit partially into this one. So that's <laughs> packaging, but you got to see it in all its glory. So this is this is the beauty right here. Oh, good. I'm so glad we so get to see it out of the box is. too. <gasps> yes. Oh, I, know. I have them in and out of box. So this is the Sapphire Dragon, and this fellow is um, already available for pre-order, and it's going to oh, be wow. coming out early August 2020, and it is truly a great like the wingspan is crazy and wow. as you can see here they're showing right now when it has light coming in behind it you have this beautiful translucency in the plastic so it really takes on those different tones like the describe and its description and more oh wow but, beautiful yeah. so yeah it's one of those things if you want to get your pre-order in you go to shop.wizkids.com and you can place your pre-order like right now if you really want to get one of these beauties <laughs> because it is fantastic and the other cool thing that's starting to happen is we're starting to place these on clear plastic bases. Oh, which you can see oh. right there. So that means when you go and you put this handsome fellow onto the table and terrify your players, the terrain that you're using will show right through as well. So it's one of those really neat, really cool features. And the more Very light cool. you have surrounding it, like it gets even more and more gorgeous. I highly recommend putting it in sunlight. <laughs> Ooh. I'm not even kidding. It's one. Hey, you guys are moving. There they are. Oh, hello. Hey, Welcome. Hi. Hi. Yeah, we we were just talking to V about the Sapphire Dragon. But before we go any further, I wanted to give you guys a moment um, as as our Wiz Kids representatives to talk a little bit about the the entire collection, the Icons of the Realms, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden lineup of minis. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All yours, okay, cool. So basically, uh, all of these lovely miniatures, there's going to be over 45 of these miniatures uh, available when the time comes. We're looking mm. at uh, September ish 2020. It's, we're trying to coincide it with the book actually when it releases. So mm. you have all these fantastic minis that are going to be coming out. And just, oh, I'm looking at the table right now, and there's just so many cool things. Uh, <laughs> let's start. Do you want to look at the snow owl bear since people are. Like, yes, 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 yes. Okay, 100%. Okay, okay, yes. Okay, so this is the little snow owl bear. <gasps> oh my god! Now, oh. this is actually a very special deal because initially what was going to happen is we brought in some uh, artists in the community to help us get these painted up. So this is one of the snow owl bears that got painted up by one of our artists so that we would have these all ready for the live event, had it at the venue. Everyone getting together, we were going to do this really fun diorama setup for everyone to enjoy oh. all the miniatures in the collection. But this is the snow owl bear that is it's part of it. It's so cute. 
<laughs> Isn't it on the position? I love the way it's sitting. It's just so darn sweet. So oh, its little mouth, like it's just making whatever I noise know. an owlbear makes. <laughs> right? I just want to feed it snacks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This little guy it's like I was wrapping it up. I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to ship you. You're too darn cute. Yeah. You um, just so, tuck them in your yes, pocket. <laughs> seriously. So it's one of those things where there are some other fantastic miniatures that are going along with this line. They're all coming pre-painted. They're coming in our booster packs. Uh, so you can get them either in the box itself or as a brick. And again, that's going to be something coming out uh, mid-September-ish. And let's see. I can also show you a couple more of the other cool guys that go along with this. Uh, we have the Yeti. Ooh. Oh, that's terrifying. Wait, oh, he's he is a monster and a half. Absolutely. Wow. So he's really... And again, this is another one of those uh, miniatures that was painted by one of our artists. And we're actually going to have a web page going up very soon to uh, reveal who our artists were because they worked really hard to get these all pulled together. And we very much appreciate all of their help with it for sure. Yeah. V, were you saying that the minis come pre-painted? Is that what they're going to look like? They're going to look very similar to this because the artists were fantastic. They worked with color guides the entire time. They were showing them to me in process, making sure that everything was going along the way they needed to, and they all followed them beautifully. So they're going to look extremely similar to what you're seeing here. Absolutely, yeah. Cool. But they are coming pre-painted. That's awesome. All right, how so do you we've guys seen... Dis... Oh. No, go ahead. Oh, just I was wondering, how do you guys decide which figures actually get made? There are so many monsters in all across D and D, so many adventures, so many figures that could possibly be made. How do you narrow that down? Oh, well, that's definitely you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do that part. I did the painting part. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, O'Hagan, and uh, I have Justin Duran with me here, uh, my boss. Uh, so we lead the RPG side uh, of at WizKids. And to answer your question, one of the things that we do is we work with wizards to kind of get the theme, the story. We get an advanced read. We get an advanced read sometime before. I won't tell you how many how many months before. <laughs> to kind of help set the, the, the kind of theme and, and story and arc, uh, what it enables us to do is, is really kind of work with wizards back and forth in an iterative environment to start describing and setting up how we want to describe um, the actual uh, step that we're building. And so what we do is we, we get the set sometime before, we work through, and uh, are able to uh, iterate with wizards back and forth. Now we've seen the, the snowy owlbear, we've seen the yeti. Are there any more from the set that you want to show us before I know we have another, another reveal that has to do with dragons, I believe? Ooh. Yeah, I can show you. Uh, let's do one more that I think is pretty cool. And oh, let's, let's pull out this fellow. This guy. It Ooh. is. Oh, he's also yeah. terrifying. Isn't it? There are some really <laughs> fantastic monsters that are getting included in this line, for sure. It's going to add some great variety to your gameplay, absolutely. And I'm so excited for people to get to see the whole entire line when the time comes. But this what is, is he another... called? This is the uh, what is it? Skeleton Frost Frost Giant? Or the Frost Giant. Oh. I was worried that yeah, was, was to scale. scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, you know, to mm. scale. <laughs> mm. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's mm. not small. He's no, no, he's not. I was like, oh, hopefully that's just a little larger than no. Oh no, it's a giant. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. No, he's 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 definitely uh intimidating. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'm glad you started as I'm glad you started us out with the cute one to lull us into complacency. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, DM, you kind of have to do that anyways. <laughs> right. True. <laughs> uh, okay. So I could show you the uh, next uh, dragon if you want. If you yeah. Want and this is the, the first look, right? Of this one. Mm -hmm. And this is one that's coming along with this line. And this is the. Oh, white. Oh, my God. Let me lean back so you can actually get more of it. Yeah. Screen. So again, we have it on the clear base so that it shows up beautifully with the terrain. Now the base, because let me tell you, these guys are, they're hefty. So we had to make the bases a little bit bigger than what they really should be. But there's going to be a marker on the bottom of the clear pl plastic so you can see what they really should be uh, marked that way. But yeah, this, um, this fellow is quite hefty. Let me get the uh, mini back out so you can see for scale. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> no. <laughs> like that. no, don't do that. Please, no. 
<laughs> those just wings are all gorgeous. Claire's yeah. dying to this dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is going to be available end of August. So this oh, is cool. Great. Yeah. Yes. And oh, that's some great, beautiful. Look at that. Isn't it awesome? Absolutely a stunner for sure. Really an Looking at piece. that art, I thought it was a painting. <laughs> well, honestly, gorgeous. I can show you. I can even show you what it looks like in box because even the box is beautiful. Oh, yeah. Let's you see wanna it. take a look here. So here it is in box. Wow. Yeah. So that's the front. And then you get this, the side panels. That's so the gorgeous cool. artwork. Isn't it amazing? Is there I mean, more on the back of this one box. too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the other Love side. It. And then here is the back. Cool. Yeah. Mm, it's gonna eat with the me. artwork. <laughs> yeah, it might. <laughs> <laughs> it just might. But yeah, that's what do you think is your favorite of all of these, V? It's a different dragon. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you ready for this one? Yes. There's more dragons. This this is my favorite, and it is massive. <gasps> Wow, what is that? What is that? This is the Shardolin. <laughs> wow. This boy is hefty. Like, actually, it's quite heavy. Um, but it is another one to coincide with the release. What's the and lore behind is, this guy? Right? He is oh. terrifying. He's terrifying. Is that, actually, that does sum it up quite well. It's a construct <laughs> who basically inflicts terror is really the best oh. way to sum up this dragon. Yeah. So you have it with the mini in there. Wow. Uh-uh. 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 No. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> Turning right back around and leaving is what I'm doing if I encounter that. <laughs> nope. 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 It's a huge so, nope. It's a huge nope. But I'm telling you, he's really quite sweet and cuddly. You can get oh, yeah? Back of the wings. Oh, so cuddly. Yeah. I, I not right <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. he's, he's huggable. You can hug him. You can give him a little <laughs> hug. <laughs> but that's how big this guy is. Like, it's got some absolute building wow. happen. Again, plastic, clear plastic, so you'll be able to see your terrain. But yeah, this wow. is my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine the, re the DM reveal on that one, pulling it out from under the table. Right. Clunk, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you I mean if you want an audio representation. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's you know, he's got some heft. So well, again, we another... we talked to Patrick and um I'm sorry, what was it? John? Is that right? Justin. Justin. Justin, sorry about that. Yeah, we talked to Patrick and Justin about um, how you decide which figures to make. But tell us a little bit about the design process. How do you how do you design them? What's the back and forth like? How long does it take? All of that. Yeah, sure. Uh, typically, you know, everything's a little bit different, but I'll just I'll just go over kind of a, a common one. Like I'll talk about the snowy owlbear, right? The one that that uh, that we all like so much. Um, <laughs> what happens is Wizard gives us some art, and it's, you know, it's, it's oftentimes, sometimes, uh, you know, it's final or close to final. We take it, we give it to our sculptors. Our sculptors go through rounds of iterations. Uh, when we're ready, uh, we kind of, uh, kind of just test size and whether or not it's actually cool enough to be on a table or cute enough to be on a table in this case. Uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> We, uh, I have to say, it's, uh, these are not all cuddly, right? You may, they may look cuddly, but they're not cuddly. Um, the, the key thing, exactly, what we're going to show you. Um, and then we kind of send it to Wizards to, for review, and there's an iteration back and forth for approval. Uh, and then we, we, we send it off. Typically, it takes about eight months for us to produce something like what you just saw with the snowy out there. Wow. Yeah. Well, it is worth starts, it. Yes, yes. Well, and now you've you've shown something under a, a cloth on your table, yeah, and now you, we can't uh, think about anything else. So tell us what's under that. You can't point out the cloth and then not right. reveal yeah, the cloth. Yeah. <laughs> Justin's, Justin, you want to talk about this? Yeah, we didn't want to one-up V, but we're going to one-up V. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> because this is like, he's so cool. When Patrick started, what, about a year and a half ago? About a year, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 Patrick was my DM back when, when I lived in Seattle, and I said, Patrick, please give us some definitive dragons, the dragons. And as you see... What V has kind of shown you has uh, been pretty awesome, but um, this guy just oh showed up at God. the house uh, just the other day. This is fresh, uh, 
from uh, our factory. Um, so Patrick, hold that up. So this is uh, the white no! dragon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's the first in our line of the new Gargantuan series. It, it comes out in January. So that's why it's still not painted, but it'll come painted. It's a Gargantuan white. It'll be a named one. I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but you can you can try to guess at who it is. It's pretty uh, heavy. <laughs> it's very heavy. And it's it's the first in our line of new Gargantuan series dragons that, that uh, will start with the white dragon. Yeah, we'll probably go through the whole cycle, the color cycle with this. Um, so people can uh, yeah. expect the whole series of these. So you're seeing pre-production first, uh, but yeah, you can see a little mini on top. I don't want it to fall, but you can kind of see that's a medium-sized creature. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. So you're saying that yeah. we'll see all of the colors of dragon come out in that gargantuan series as well? Eventually over time, yes. Yeah. Cool. The, the first thing you see is uh, V held up, held up that adult dragon, the white one. Uh, we mm -hmm. have the first two coming out in next month, the sapphire and the white. December has the next one. I can tell you it's a black. Uh, and then from then on, we're going to have all the chromatics, all the metallics, as well as shadow and everything else you can imagine, including dragon adventures. Yes. <laughs> and the Gargantuan series? Yeah. The Gargantuan I series, I I'm not, I can't tell you what's coming with Gargantuan, but next year there may be more than one. The white one for sure comes oh. out in January. Um, they will be additional ones uh, that you, we will tell you about as uh, time comes on. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Slight tease there. Yeah. Uh, and for the people asking in the chat, the price is uh, for your white and sapphire. There's sixty nine ninety nine, and the chartelin is seventy nine ninety nine. And again, check it out on our uh, website. That is shop.wizkids.com if you want to get your pre orders in for the sapphire dragon, especially. And with all this new exciting reveals, are there any other releases coming up that you want to hype up? I mean, I'm like taking my credit card out right now and going to buy a horde of dragons, but I need to hear even well, more. <laughs> that's great. Justin's gonna show you two more, one, one more thing we have to show you and I'll tell you one more. Mm -hmm. So uh, we worked with Wizards of the Coast to actually create a line of two dimensional minis that'll be called Idols of the Realm. This Ooh. one comes out in September, Ooh. right? This, this is the Abominable Yeti. It's just the same Yeti that we saw in three dimensional form now in two-dimensional form. Uh, so we're gonna come out with an entire line of two-dimensional mini for D&D, and they're gonna be called Idols of the Realm. The, the, uh, the, the, the set for this release, which is the, uh, the Icewind Dale set, comes out in December. Additionally, uh, because Icewind Dale is so critical to the, the storyline, and I won't tell you anymore, uh, <laughs> but we're coming out with four houses that are paper craft, so that you can have mm. a little town setting that allows you to actually play and engage and it'll be the roofs open the, the, they come off so it'll be very engaging and good thing affordable yeah wow yeah. oh i love that yeah. the yeah. reveals just kept coming during this segment we we thought we were done and then boom 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 more and more and more right thank you guys you brought us so much yeah. exciting stuff thank you so much for your time to be here with us and to tell us about these new products we can't wait to get our hands on them and now we are going to uh, have to say goodbye to our friends from WizKids, but don't worry because we will be coming up with a game with Deborah Ann Wall as the DM. That's also going to feature yes. Sam Richardson, Janina Gavankar, Amy Acker, Matthew Lillard, Jay Ellis, and of course, like I said, the DM, Deborah Ann Wall. So don't forget during that and in between on the break, you can visit dndlive2020.com and donate to Red Nose Day. Remember that Dungeons and Dragons is matching up to $125,000. Mika, this has been a, a whirlwind of new stuff. Are you excited? I'm I'm excited. I'm exhausted. I'm going yeah. broke all at the same time. <laughs> this has been such an amazing day of D&D &D already. And like we said, that's the point of D&D &D Live Roll with Advantage. We're celebrating D&D &D and we're celebrating this awesome community. And dragons. Did you see those dragons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sure did. I can't those wait to see dragons. more. I can't wait and you'll see dragons. more of us as well. We'll be back at the end of the day to talk and geek out even more. But right now, let's get right into that game. We'll see you soon. <laughs> 